our first speaker for this morning. He is from Johannesburg, Thomas Chapman, who studied architecture and urban design from the University of Witwatersrand. Chapman spent time working as the researcher in the fields of oral history and civic engagement, then joined Civil Rights and Leslie Carson as a professional architect in 2009. In 2012, Chapman founded local studio in Brixton, Johannesburg, with a diverse portfolio of built works comprising public buildings, urban design schemes, and private houses. Today, we are delighted to have Thomas Chapman here with us as our first speaker. A round of applause. Let's give a warm welcome to Thomas Chapman from South Africa up to the stage. Greetings from Johannesburg, South Africa. My name is Thomas Chapman. Thank you very much for inviting me to present to you today. It's an honor to be here. Where I'm from, the sun is just starting to peak up over the horizon. And for architects, the Johannesburg skyline is probably most famous for a scary 50-story residential tower built in 1975 called Ponte City. The tower was featured in a number of Hollywood blockbusters like District 9 and this little-known advert for Mercedes-Benz. I'm Thomas Chapman. I'm an architect and urban designer. I'm Takura Changwa. I'm also an architect and a former Ponte Tower resident. Although it's remained iconic, Ponte Tower over the years has developed a bad reputation. But what we are now seeing is renewal, and it's all starting with a little daycare center at the bottom of the tower. Challenge is a safe place where the children of Ponte can spend their time, learn and play together. With the X-Class, what we saw was an opportunity to do something nice for the children of Ponte. Something different that would get them to look at the place where they live in a different way. And we wanted to involve them in the whole process. So what we decided to do was turn the inner core of Ponte Tower into a makeshift cinema. I think in South Africa we have a tendency to overlook the beauty in our cities. And I think it's time to reconnect with urban spaces and the people that live there. Two small disclaimers. This car has not sold very well in South Africa. It's uh, probably the last time anyone tries to get an architect to sell a car. Um, secondly, despite what Mercedes would like you to think, the so-called no rediscovery of urban spaces is really not the norm in my continent. Unfortunately, like many other cities in the developing world, even KL, instead of trying to rediscover and work with what we have, in times of crisis, yes, we're in a crisis, there is a knee-jerk tendency to start cities from scratch. In fact, this was a headline from our new president's State of the Nation address given just before I left. I dream of a South Africa where the first entirely new city in the dem democratic era rises with skyscrapers, schools, universities, hospitals and factories. This dream has been fueled by my conversations with President Xi Jinping, whose account of how China is building a new Beijing has helped to consolidate my dream. Has the time not arrived to build a new smart city founded on the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution? So what's wrong with this? Nothing, right? Except that most of us living in these cities are faced with what we might call a leftover city. And in most cases, these leftovers are probably the most accurate reflection of the social, environmental, economic, and political health that we have. Most cities in the developing world are recovering from colonialism, some more recently than others. South Africa departed from our very own mutant form of colonialism, which became known as apartheid 25 years ago. Apartheid was a policy that sought to separate people of different races, favoring whites and completely disenfranchising people of color. City centers were built to a very high quality, but reserved for whites only. In Johannesburg, we even had our own tower built by Skidmore, Owings and Merrill. It's in the top left corner of this picture, built in 1972. 50 stories only. 
at the dawn of independence, these old cities started leaking capital and this vacuum was replaced with an informal economy that did not have the means or the skills or the will to maintain the ruins. Fortunately for capital, colonialism left us with town planning policies that are specifically engineered to expand cities horizontally in more siloed ways. The Indian architect Rahul Merotra refers to this phenomenon in India as the landscapes of impatient capital. And these, no, these new so-called smart cities that are being built are actually dumb cities in that they are designed and built too quickly by singular actors. They are resource hungry and almost always hidden behind massive walls and gatehouses. So instead of uniting populations previously divided by race, they now divide us by income group. These dumb cities are one of the greatest acts of procrastination in the world today. So what am I actually talking about and advocating in my work? That the past is actually the future. By focusing on what others deem to be the worst of our cities, as architects we can learn from what a, from what a post-crisis world looks like and how to find clever and unusual solutions to ubiquitous problems. A focus on the so-called leftovers can also teach us how to engage communities worst affected by massive change. The first theme in my work might be termed adaptive reuse, although that term doesn't sit so well with me. When I think about adaptive reuse, I think about a Pinterest board with art galleries occupying old power stations, frozen in time as crisp memorializations of the past. I prefer to think of the notion of resilient infrastructure, of buildings that can continuously adapt without too much effort to market shifts. When we talk about reuse, we can, use, we can focus on multi-use typologies. In my, in my work, I find this most prevalent in the shift from commercial office space to housing and from industrial space to social infrastructure. But the picture on the screen right now is a, an immigrant Somali community that lives in Johannesburg that we did a framework for. And um, what was extraordinary was this is a, 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 a culture of trading. And these were old suburban houses that they simply removed the front wall and opened the, the, the former living, living rooms and these, this became a retail strip and this is what I'm talking about. I also like to think of the city floor as a resilient space capable of adapting to new demands with a little help from urban designers. I founded my practice but began testing formative ideas earlier than that. Two projects which illustrate this are an informal trader's store that I combined with a billboard in 2007 and a mobile bread shop in 2009, designed to deliver bread to parts of a Johannesburg slum that were unreachable by car. I established my office, local studio, in 2012. Today we're around 15 people. This is the construction of our own office building, which we undertook in 2015. We're in the middle floor. It's clear to the neighborhood when we're on a deadline, because the facade is translucent. By the way, I'm probably breaking one of Christian's golden Instagram rules here, but give us a follow if you're interested. <laughs> the first project I'll discuss today is called Bromfontein Gate and involves the creation of 400 affordable housing units in the burnt-out shell of a 30-story office tower built for the French oil company Total in 1976. The building started its life as one of the highest-grade office buildings in South Africa, but by the 1990s was 50% vacant due to its unattractive location for corporates. In 2014, the top two floors of the building caught fire, destroying the entire core. The ground floor used to be a massive banking hall, but was mothballed way before the building had been condemned. Developers will often pick up these buildings for nothing and try to maximize efficiency. I've got a theory that the former owner actually started the fire. Um, the affordability level of the housing market in South Africa is weighted at 70% with a household income of $350 per month, forcing developers to build schemes that are accessible to this market, deeming this a version of entirely unsubsidized affordable housing. Projects like this mostly involve the creation of internal partitions to define apartments within deep floor plates which previously were open plan offices. The cheapest way to do this would be with cement stock brick walls, and this is far more to do with the low cost of labor. Migrant workers are paid less than $10 a day in South Africa. Fortunately, the structural systems of most of these old commercial buildings can't support heavy interior walling, 
forcing the introduction of innovative lightweight walling systems and an upskilling of workers in much friendlier working conditions. We imagined four different affordable housing typologies which slotted into the old floor plate, trying our best to maximize natural light and ventilation to all spaces. This was particularly different, difficult in the deepest part of the floor plate, which was over 10 meters. The interior walls are rendered polystyrene, and the most interesting part of our intervention was the adjustment of the dark glass sunshades, which actually obstructed the view of the city when you were standing up. This was when the building was an office building in the 70s. And we turned that into, those into balustrades by cutting the steel frames and moving them up 800 millimeters. The glass was found to be brittle, and we couldn't afford to replace to the same spec, so we opted instead for white corrugated iron, which makes the building stand out on the horizon. This is a resident on one of these new balconies, which are sturdier than they actually look. One of the main exterior alterations was the insertion of a shade canopy around the perimeter of the building. Office buildings built in this era seemed to assume that everyone would, ar would arrive by car. So we actually had to introduce an intervention that would make the building a lot friendlier for pedestrians in the rain. The outdoor plaza linked to the massive banking halls on the ground floor, which we transformed into communal spaces for tenants, something that makes the building very popular a very popular place to live today, while a massive departure from traditional housing. This was a marketing video prepared when their partners set up for letting. You excuse the cheesy music, it wasn't my choice. Along with this project, we lobbied the city council to develop the space adjacent to the tower from what was previously a dump site into a pedestrian promenade. Generally, our city is extremely conservative when it comes to design specs for public spaces, mainly because they don't want to maintain anything. We were able to deviate from their rule book significantly by proposing that the apartment building subsidize urban management. The building owners were able to employ gardeners and security guards by adding less than $10 per month extra onto each apartment rental. The promenade is at once a linear space for movement capable of housing a large volume of pedestrians and a series of circular plazas, each with a tree at its center and a bench at its edge. The promenade is situated alongside one of the busiest vehicular streets in Johannesburg, which also happens to host our bus rapid transit line. It's gratifying to see that we were able to give almost as much space to pedestrians as all the vehicular modes combined. Sadly, this is not the norm, and was sneaked past the transport planners, who had they known there was all that space, they'd definitely have pushed for another, another car lane there. And the promenade actually links the biggest railway station in, in Johannesburg, which is south of the frame, to our city hall, which you'll see emerging at the top of the, of the screen just now. That's City Hall in the, in the top. Conceptually, this promenade fits into a broader agenda in my office to promote the development of more pedestrian public space in our cities. We're significantly under on the UN Habitat recommended quota of 15 square meters public open space per capita because in our city, the majority of open spaces were built over, leaving only vehicular streets as opportunities to create more open space. We worked with traffic engineers and developed a plan in 2011 to identify all the streets in a part of downtown Johannesburg called Bramfontein, which could be pedestrianized. The main street right for, right for pedestrianization is a street called Juta Street, and although we were only able to implement this pedestrianization via you know, portions of architectural projects, um, 
in a piecemeal way. This became the, we became the unofficial custodians of the street and we were able to catch the attention of various actors who had intention of upgrading and developing the area. Most notably was the University of the Witwatersrand, which is our biggest uh, academic university in, in Johannesburg. And they own a massive portion of downtown Johannesburg. They've got it entirely gated off from the city via five kilometers of, wall, of security walling and only four major entry points. The university were interested in our pedestrianization strategy as they were only just starting to become aware of the needs of the over 25,000 pedestrians who use the campus. We gathered and visualized some of the card swipe data from the, from the various security entrances and were fascinated to find that one entrance in particular, which you can see the black dots on the right of the, of the map that look like zombies, um, that entrance had over 20,000 card swipes per day, all funneling into this fateful prison-like entrance. The university had just, just recovered from a spate of fee protests, so we, they weren't interested at all in our suggestions to remove the walls completely. So we developed a strategy that looked to push back the wall and give space back to the city. So all the red hatching that you see here was proposed to f as fully accessible pedestrian public space. So you wouldn't have to swipe your card to get to those spaces. We were able to implement two of the, the proposed seven nodes along the southern edge of the university. The first was the one mentioned earlier with the 20,000 card swipes. You couldn't imagine a more undignified to enter a place of, of higher learning when we, when we found this site. For this entrance, we took a cue from retail economics and proposed a new restaurant at the edge, which could, which could both capitalize from, on the footfall, but also serve as passive surveillance at quieter times. We also made the entrance fully universally accessible and used the design of the, of the wheelchair ramp to introduce a lot more landscaping along the edge. We proposed the concept for urban umbrellas, which would shelter arriving and dwelling students, but also provide Wi-Fi and charging points. The umbrellas are positioned adjacent to the various kiosks to perform the role of a traditional pavement canopy. We also proposed an entirely new entrance carved between two 1970s brutalist buildings on the campus's southern edge. Here we were able to steal a lot more public space and apart from the programs of the other gateway, we could create a small park at the top of the alley as well. Materially, we chose to line the, these new carved open spaces with a highly contrasting steel wall. Incidentally, this is the color of the university, so the wall also served as a billboard for the new signage. The project was speedily implemented, largely due to the mid -year during the mid-year recess, and this definitely, definitely influenced the construction technology. This uh, video on the right you see was over a weekend when the umbrellas were being craned into sight. Incidentally, there, were only, there was only one place in Johannesburg which could bend round tube to this radius. It was a small funny workshop you see in the image on the left. We've done a fair amount of post-occupancy analysis with students and found that most of, them, most of them are very proud of their gateways. It's a really good selfie spot. And what was previously an undignified and uncomfortable squeeze through a flat wall is now a gradual process of envelopment into the campus. I hope that in some way the gateways help to ease the anxiety of arriving for an exam. The image on the right is, the, is a new little park that we created. These are some of the retail information kiosks carved into the new blue wall and the new signage on the right. The umbrellas also light up at night, providing a safe space for people on the other side of the wall, saying that makes me think of the Night's Watch. I like to think of this project as a filling station for pedestrians. It's been one of our most controversial and it's actually reviled by a lot of academics at our institution we have a joke that it looks like the constructing, construction hoarding is still up. Um, but who cares what they think? Another project that came, that came our way thanks to our proposal to pedestrianize Juta Street was a little design gallery situated at probably the most dangerous part of the street. This was the building as we found it. Our first site meeting was held in the Shabin on the ground floor 
The Shabin is South African vernacular term for, for a tavern. We had to roll out our drawings on the snooker tables at the meetings. And, and from one day to the next, we actually noticed fresh bullet holes on the walls. No jokes at all. <laughs> this is where I come from. The construction process was very interesting, as you can imagine. This was a, a, a building that had started its life as a small factory. It had then changed, changed use twice before we found it, from factory to office to residential slum on the upper floors. The demo process was pretty wild, as you can imagine, but we didn't find any dead bodies, fortunately. The building consists of four floors. A restaurant and gallery at ground floor, designers' showrooms and studios at first and second, and the top floor is a flexible event space, which could be converted to two apartments, should the owners decide to do this at a later stage. The building developed quite an iconic facade clad in pink and green mosaic tiles. The most prominent design feature is actually a goods hoist in the central structural bay, which enables the vertical transport of large artworks as well as people. The hoist works in such a way that people can enter it directly from the street, like an alternative front door. Here's a video of the hoist in action, which is in, in and of itself a performative piece on the street facade. Interior spaces are designed to be very well lit and, nat and, and neutral gallery spaces. They're very low tech actually with, with zero HVAC and very, very simple spec lighting. The space exhibits some of South Africa's best furniture and product designers and tries its best not to compete with some of the very loud pieces that are shown. The building was designed in collaboration with the designers who would, who would be exhibiting. And in fact, the couple that you see on the right of the screen actually have a share in the building. The top floor is the most flexible of all, and as I mentioned, is designed to be easily adapted to become two apartments if required. For now, we, we play a part in its programming, and I teach classes there to my postgraduate students from the University of Johannesburg. We also hosted our book launch there last year. Now time for the shameful plug of the book, so it's available for purchase on our website if you're interested. Although the street-facing southern elevation is undoubtedly the hero, the building actually gets all its light from the north, which faces an alleyway. This has become a multi-tiered communal courtyard and is a, a homage to Baragan and or Ricardo Bofill. Okay, so the first new built project I want to show today is called the Outreach Foundation. This is a community center built for a non-profit in the poorest part of downtown Johannesburg. This is the densest part of the city and probably experienced the most radical transition after apartheid. It's an area where over 10,000 apartments were abandoned by white residents in the late 70s and a large number of these hijacked and illegally occupied for the next 30 years. The project shares a city block with the Hillbrow Lutheran Church, which is the, the tower you see at the, at the bottom of this image. It's one of the oldest buildings in Johannesburg. And our building was one of the first new build social infrastructure projects in this part of downtown Johannesburg since it was abandoned in the 1970s. When we met this client, they had secured about $200,000 through a national lottery grant and had, an, had appointed a, another architect to design a small brick building to sit alongside an unfinished community hall. The director of the nonprofit changed and he was very uninspired by the previous design. We, and I was just starting out, and uh, we were invited to pitch an idea. <clears throat> and he had no, he'd never worked with architects before, so he didn't ask me for any references, thank God. The actual building site is the staggered rooftop of the, of the unfinished hall, and, and was built as part of the German consulate in the 70s, and they obviously also abandoned the city when, when things started getting bad. The building's three primary functions are draped over this unfinished hall. It's a computer center on the ground floor, a dance studio at the first floor, and meeting areas at the top floor. All, spe all spaces feed onto a communal, semi-public roof garden. 
I definitely lied when I said they could get my building for the price of the previous one. And I, I went about trying to find a, a ready-made steel structure in our kind of farmer's trade literature, because I thought that might be the cheapest way to, 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 to get the most space. As an architect, I've always been interested in working smart rather than hard. I'm not ashamed to say that I do try to find quick solutions to problems. And I also avoid working from first principles. In my search for the ready-made shed, I encountered a, a host of suppliers who were selling cold rolled sections uh, construction, but they weren't having much luck in our, in our relatively untransformed industry. And, and we ended up building the, the largest building in cold rolled steel that, that had ever been built in South Africa because nobody trusted the technology. A very interesting side note, when the building was exactly at this stage, I can name the date, it was no, November the 8th, 2013. Kingo Kuma was in Johannesburg to give a lecture. I'd been deliberating on a cladding material for the structure and I actually asked his opinion. That was just before I, we took this photo and he said just leave it like that. And that's exactly what we did. So the building's main entrance and east facade is imagined as a translucent vertical street. The building also presents its primary function, which is the dance studio, to a main street on the west through a 12 meter window. Here are the interiors of each of those spaces. This is the dance studio in use and the meeting rooms. The building was funded through a national lottery grant and there was, there was no money remaining for the construction of the exterior roof deck. So as I mentioned, I was in the, I was very early days of practice and I had the impression that if the project runs out of money, it's my job to find the money to finish it. So I launched a crowdfunding campaign to build the roof deck. And, and, and received most of the budget from housing companies in the area whose buildings looked down onto the deck. And when the building host opened, we hosted a uh, shortened version of Swan Lake. And I wasn't done with fundraising and applied for a grant to build a piece of street furniture across the street to, for pedestrians to watch the dance studio. And this was built concurrently and provides a place of respite for pedestrians on their commute on the other side of the street. This is the dancers hiding from that audience. We were on a roll and completed yet another pro bono project for this client, a micro counseling center situated on the same site catering to refugees. This was built by Argentinian immigrants and actually hosts individual group counseling to refugees and victims of human trafficking. I'll now show a short video we made about the, the buildings, narrated by the convener of the theater program. I think Hilbra is a vibrant African cosmopolitan area that is exciting and sexy. It's very much part of the inner city, and one may argue that it is the heart. Hilbra, in the inner city of Johannesburg, one of the most densely populated areas in the world, it has this reputation of being a kind of violent, drug infested. And yet, there are always surprising contradictions. So we raised some money, I think in about 2009, to initially create a building that would house a homework program. We had a new manager who came on board and met with Thomas Chapman. I think Thomas was just starting out as an architect and he came with quite radical proposals. He said, actually, let's not have the building there, but let's place it on top of an existing building, and let's try and reimagine what that building is. I think what Local Studio brought to, to both the Outreach Foundation and Hillbra was kind of a fresh design approach using different kinds of material, which, is, which adds a surprise. So included in that building is this beautiful outside deck, rooftop deck space, which has become a sort of multi-purpose space for meetings, for people just to hang out. We've done performances there. We've had music events, poetry events. 
suppose the biggest question, the biggest challenge is always security. They still are abandoned buildings, hijacked buildings, which are quite scary spaces. So how do you create a safe space? But how do you create a space that is open and that is freely accessible? One has to be hopeful. One has to trust that things will get better. The children and youth that we work with, I think, are very focused, committed, passionate. And we've got to just keep on engaging an exercise in reimagining what Hillbra, what the inner city can be, um, not to impose that, and not to gentrify, um, but to create meaningful, authentic change. The next new build project I'd like to show could also be seen as an adaptation of, industri of an industrial typology. In designing this project, what I discovered is that in apartheid era, former black townships, you'll struggle to find a school hall or any indoor space capable of gathering over a thousand people. The, f the sad fact is now, where the previous government did not develop these spaces for political reasons, we're finding in the present day that retrofitting schools with these multi-purpose hall spaces is not a priority for our present government for budget reasons. Our client, the African School for Excellence, is a private social enterprise aimed at revolutionizing the face of modern education in Africa. They have the very ambitious goal of providing a million African scholars access to world-class education over the next 20 years. The African School for Excellence model uses innovative space planning and smart technology to significantly reduce tuition costs without reducing quality. The budget for their very first school campus, catering to 600 scholars, was around $700,000. The average size for this kind of school, including a multi-purpose hall, is around 5,000 square meters, this, or 55,000 square feet. Works out to about $13 a square foot. So we designed this building as a series of six classroom clusters arranged around a 2,000 square meter central courtyard space. We then spanned a lightweight roof between the classroom blocks to create the multi-purpose hall. We were able to save considerable amounts of money by treating the floor as we would an outdoor space, using traditional paving on compacted earth. Each of the classroom clusters, which are termed learning communities, are designed around the education model, which rotates learners between spaces for instructional learning, which is from a teacher, peer-based learning, where, where they teach each other, and self-study throughout a school day, which starts at 7 and ends at 4.30. The main urban intervention of the building is the extrusion of the building's east elevation outwards to create a triple volume entrance portico designed to welcome the neighborhood into the building. The hall performs as a multi-purpose space hosting assemblies in the mornings and classes in the afternoons. On weekends it's used for events. And we imagine this portico as a mouth that kind of eats children. The short drone video follows the route of a child walking to school. So you see that the roads aren't even tarred. So it's quite a, you know, it was quite an interesting context to arrive and build a building. The portico, along with the building's faceted a uh, roof is visible from far away and serves as a, a landmark for children res and residents. So it's become a kind of the city hall for the for the this um, township. In the lead up to the 2010 Soccer World Cup, our previous mayor took one too many trips to Curitiba and hurriedly tried to complete a BRT network. This did well for the World Cup, but hasn't got wealthier Joburgers out of their cars or poorer Joe Burgers out of the traditional 25-seater minibus taxis, which despite being the main cause of, of over 14,000 road deaths per year, remain the closest thing we have to a functional public transport system. 
One of the failures of the BRT system was that it served to entrench a kind of neo-apartheid in that it, it created impenetrable curbing and stations which divided communities that were previously separated by major roads. And the more I research this issue around BRT, I find it's actually a, a prevalent issue um, in, in other communities around the world. The Westbury Pedestrian Bridge was conceptualized five years after the completion of one of these BRT routes and comprises a pedestrian bridge with access to the BRT station, an amphitheater, and a park. Initial research established that the on-grade crossing was extreme, extremely dangerous for pedestrians, particularly school children. And this design tries to combine a bridge and a public recreational space to encourage usage and general safety. There are several bridges in planning and implementation stage in South Africa intended to create pedestrian connectivity between areas purposely sep separated by highway infrastructure. The most high profile of these is a new link between Alexandra and Santon called the, the Great Walk. Alexandra is a very dense and poor black area of over a million people and Santon is the richest square mile in Africa. It's, it's our CBD 2.0 that I mentioned earlier and our Wall Street. There's, there's generally very little material innovation in these projects, meaning that despite looking very heavy and imposing, they will take five years to build and therefore will be plagued by cost overruns and labor issues to the extent that by the time they're complete, the, su the surrounding community have a negative impression of them. This was the temporary footbridge built over the highway, which created access for, for pedestrians while the Great Walk was being completed. This one was built in four weeks. I was inspired by the ingenuity of this one, but also by the ephemerality, all of which emerged from, the emerged from the fact that it was only supposed to be there for a short while. We seem to be better architects when we don't think too hard about it. We used models and worked hard with the project engineers to ensure none of the larger urban design concepts or the small smaller details were lost. The bridge was erected over eight hours on a chilly Wednesday evening in, in June 2016. Here is the shot of the ensemble complete. The architecture of the bridge itself was governed by a need to create a landmark while promoting this concept of ephemerality. It was very important to us that the bridge didn't appear to be an extravagance in the community and that it blended in with humility while still being a point of pride. The park we built along with the bridge serves to ensure that there is always activity at the base in South Africa, staircases leading up to bridges can be some of the most dangerous spaces in the city. Unfortunately, we didn't have enough space on the other side to introduce some of the program, but we tried to work with the form of the staircases to enable some level of placemaking. One more video, again on my choice of music. Last project. After all this steel, I'd like to end with a project made of wood. This was a commemorative arch built for the Cleric and Nobel Peace Prize winner Desmond Tutu in 2017. This project was a collaboration with the Norwegian architecture firm Snohetta and was our first project built outside of Johannesburg in Cape Town. The arch occupies a very tense site between the South African Parliament building 
and the St. George's Cathedral, where Archbishop Tutu was the resident uh, priest in the 1990s. And it, the arch consists of 14 intertwined strands of bent wood, representing the 14 chapters of our Constitution. The arch is actually built over one of the oldest functional roads in Cape Town, dating back to the 1600s, and had to be tall enough to allow a fire truck through. I recently learned that this, that this arch the arch we, we made has more followers than me on Instagram, so again, I'd like your, your help, yeah? <laughs> Thank you very much for listening.